good morning or good noon. <laughs> good. <laughs> Uh, so that's the agenda of my talk. So in the second part of my presentation, I'll go to uh, some more visionary stuff of uh, why do you want to combine global data with proprietary data, what it takes to do so, uh, how analytics on big knowledge graphs can help you do it, and, and what GraphDB offers to, to enable this. So uh, I started context back in year 2000. Back then, it was like semantic web pioneer thing. Uh, no, no, no longer the case for quite a while because, as many of you probably know, around 2007-8, Semantic Web was uh, a bit out of fashion. So we went doing a number of other things that you just see based on the same technology stack and standards. Uh, we have most of, probably half of our clients are here in London. Uh, and then we have uh, quite, quite some clients in New York and the rest is uh, the long tail. Uh, we had the chance to do a lot of research, we got financing to do a lot of more research. We've been on all sorts of semantic, web semantic technology events forever and, and the industry bodies. Uh, but what we're actually trying to do and what, what came up as a, as a mission of a company that started as a technology company and, and, and we had to take our time to figure out <laughs> why we are doing this. So most of the usage is um, enterprises and essentially helping enterprises combine the diverse data and link it to content and extract information from unstructured content. So technology-wise, we do graph database and text mining. Uh, we've been doing uh, uh, wire scale symbolic reasoning, like the normal how to uh, uh, things, description logics, many other things. Nowadays, we are more into, uh, we are shifting more towards uh, statistical inference, machine learning techniques. Uh, and when, when you deal with data and enterprise data for so long, you figure out that, well, technology is good, but you get to know the data. There is no technology that's good for all sorts of data. So it uh, requires good tuning for, for specific domains. And we've been spending quite some time in uh, dealing with company data, working with publishers, uh, and also life sciences, pharma, government. So, we are best known for our uh, database engine. It's called GraphDB. Uh, and it is like uh, uh, in, in the top graph databases. You see in this ranking, you have very few, uh, very few triple stores, probably only Virtuoso and ourselves. Um, so uh, we, well, we like analytics. It's quite a lot of fun. So historically, we did a lot of analytics. We, uh, two years ago, back in June 2016, uh, we, 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 predicted, uh, we predicted Brexit. So we, we yeah, yeah, we did. We, 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 published, we published a white paper on, on, on 14th of June, a week before Brexit, based on analysis of a million of tweets, uh, saying uh, in Twitter, based on all sorts of analytics, like. Uh, uh, number of tweets and then number of impressions, number of interactions, influencers, number of people who follow this and that. So it was like five or six different metrics. And it was clear cut that the support for Brexit in Twitter alone was like twice higher. <laughs> Let's go. And this was a week before, before that. So Did you short the pound? Sorry? Did you short the pound? Uh, no, it was me. <laughs> uh, but in fact, most of the time, in order to get to these uh, fancy things, you have to do a lot of heavy lifting in terms of just putting the right types of data together, reconciling, linking, cleaning. And that's what most of our technology actually does to allow, most of the time, other people, data scientists, to, 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 to do the fancy stuff on top of it. Uh, so we, what's unique is that we have plenty of vendors in the database space, we have plenty of vendors in the text analytics, there are very few companies which do both and know how to combine both very well. Uh, well we, we had the chance to do a lot of advanced research uh, uh, when, when we started, and then in the last 10 years we've been actually uh, uh, taking care to productize these uh, fancy algorithms and technology and inference and machine learning uh, to make it robust enough to, to back like uh, Financial Times website or BBC website or uh, uh, quite a number of others. So that's roughly uh, the, the yeah, some indicative selection of our users. 
Uh, you see many of them being in the publishing. We have uh, uh, three out of the top five uh, uh, science, technology, medicine publishers. Uh, and I, I, I'll speak a bit more on BBC because this was sort of the first and um, yeah, like the uh, pioneer uh, project that, that demonstrates that this technology can, can be used in media and publishing. Uh, and nowadays we're more into yeah, dealing with uh, business information uh, for people like Standard and Poor's, Nikkei, uh, and, and, and others. So enough uh, about it. So if we, if we have to start with the basic thing of uh, like what so sort of technology, what sort of uh, machinery you need to, to, to put different types of data together. Uh, one use case is uh, imagine you want to uh, identify suspicious uh, patterns in uh, uh, relationships between companies. Uh, so you can put together a company database that, that is telling you that Big Box Cafe is located in Seattle uh, and it controls Global Investment Inc. and it controls my, my local cafe. Uh, and then you can have this linked to a geographical database uh, that knows that Seattle is part of Washington, part of US, and West Bay appears to be uh, district in, in Cayman Islands and so on and so forth. So uh, one application of this technology using, using graphs and, and, and connecting data from different sources uh, is to make it very easy to detect patterns like this. You have company in US that controls another company in US through a company in an offshore zone. Could be just fine, but there are plenty of people who want to know these patterns. And, and, and with this technology, to, 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 to do it right, you should be able to, okay, put the company data with the geographic data together, and then do all these small steps of inference that after, after that make, make queries, queries really fast to allow you to, to do this kind of uh, pattern matching on top of uh, several billion facts uh, in a matter of a second. Uh, so that's where we sort of get started. Uh, to support this use case, you should be able to ingest the data <laughs> from different sources. Uh, so we, we, uh, it was probably uh, a year ago when I tasked our team, well, look, I want to ingest C, uh, CSV as easy as in Excel. You know, in Excel, you, you, you open a CSV, you say, I have header line, I don't have header line. You gotta uh, use this column as a date and this column as a number, and there you go. Uh, we did this uh, integrating OpenRefine, which uh, allows you to preview your table data before you load it in the graph. Do some analytics of like, see what are the most popular values in a specific column on the fly, really, uh, directly. And then the, ne the next task is, uh, again, as part of this ingestion process to reconciliate data. So if you have uh, airports, uh, to be able to reconcile cities and countries uh, to entities that you already have in your knowledge graph. So uh, there is a very simple interface that allows you to say, well, I want to, to reconcile column city uh, to the class city. Uh, and there you go and you get some candidates you can choose and, 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 and move forward or add, add new values. Quite often to make this reconciliation right, you actually need to, uh, to, 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 to get involved some, some, some other columns to, to, to give you more context so that matching is more likely to happen. So St. Anthony, there's <coughs> plenty of St. Anthony's all over the world. And to, cho to choose the right one, <coughs> it helps a lot if you use the country column. And uh, it's not rocket science, but having the tooling that allows you to, to do it like as easy as in Excel is, is quite a big thing. So you, you, you can say, I also want to use the country column with matching it to, to whatever values. And then you can use country to reconcile city and city to reconcile airport and make these combinations again life. Okay, you got your graph. <laughs> so you ingested it from here and there, you loaded uh, geo names, you know that uh, loaded few other data sources, uh, you put it in, you, got, you, you should be able to explore it. Uh, you see a bit of this in, in the demo. Uh, being able to properly search and, 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 and pick up concepts in a big knowledge graph, uh, speaking of billions of things, is really 
uh, not, not of trivial thing. And we have also suggest that that you use cognitive analytics to figure out which is the, 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 the best one, at least the most important one, the, the one that is most likely that you to, 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 to search for. Uh, you see it in action. Then you can visualize, of course, one note at a time uh, and, and expand uh, and, and so on, and then see some features. Uh, do some, some Sparkle queries, and that's sort of a trivial thing. It helps if I in, the, in the Sparkle editor you have the kind of auto-suggest uh, because in, in, in a schema where you integrate the data from multiple sources, you are very, very likely to have like hundreds of classes and uh, properties that most of you wouldn't remember easily. So th for, for some of the demonstrations, uh, I'll use a service called FactForge. Uh, what it is, it's the English version of DBpedia plus geonames plus the mappings between these guys. Some company data from different sources and a lot of news, a lot of news metadata. Uh, like more than a million news articles annotated and linked to this knowledge graph. Uh, so all together we are speaking of like two billion triples. Uh, and that's the point where I'll make the first demo, figuring out uh, what uh, what do you have in a in a big knowledge graph uh, like this is not easy because. Uh, in this case, in, in, in this demonstrator, we have 1,400 different classes. 1,400 different classes. So figuring out whether what is what, which are the most important classes, how many uh, things I have of this class and that class is, I mean, you can, of course, do endless sparkling, but that's not the fastest thing on Earth. So we did this. Um, visualization that helps us see the biggest classes and their subclasses. So you can say, well, agent, what, what's that? That's actually the super class for organizations and people. Uh, and then, well, people, how, ma how many people I have? Uh, I immediately see that I have 1.3 million people in this data set. I get some samples, I see the subclasses. Uh, organizations, well, fine, I have like 300,000 uh, organizations. Uh, I get some samples, see that. Actually, plenty of those are sports teams, 34,000, uh, uh, and only like 70,000 of those are companies, and so on and so forth. So that, that's this kind of tooling that if you have uh, uh, the kind of knowledge graph that, that, that I'm showing, you absolutely need it to be able to figure out what's in there. Uh, and even more like being able to figure out what are the typical connections uh, between, between classes. So you see that in this data set, it turns out uh, geographic features are most uh, heavily interconnected with other things, be it with documents or with people. And then you can easily click and, 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 and analyze what are the most typical, typical uh, relationship types between a geographic feature uh, and a person. And then you see five features. Say, ah, okay, then probably I, I, I did the mapping wrong. This shouldn't be here. But you need the tools that allow you to very easily spot uh, these, these distributions in, in your data. So, so much about it. Uh, this was the story of how, what it takes and what kind of tooling you need to put a big knowledge graph together. And the question, what do you do with this big knowledge graph? One of the use cases I'm presenting is, uh, well, what uh, uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Jem Rayfield, uh, define, uh, yeah, defined as dynamic semantic publishing like uh, back in 2010. Uh, and the concept was, imagine you have tons of, uh, tons of content in this case. The first project they did was for the World Cup, uh, Soccer World Cup, Football World Cup 2010. So they, 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 they had a knowledge graph with all the players, all the teams, all, all, all the groups, uh, referees, whatever. Uh, and and, and they, they, they use, uh, again, this kind of technology to uh, annotate, uh, to link, to tag all the content that, that comes related to this event with references to these concepts. Uh, and then when you go to the website, they were maintaining 800 web pages uh, about each, each entity in this knowledge graph, each player, each team, each group, everything. Uh, so when, when if, if, yeah, did, did any of you uh, went to the BBC website back 2010? Yeah. I see some people nodding. 
so uh, if you go there, you can go to the, the, to, 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 to the page for Frank Lampard, and it is actually populated with, uh, there is a template for players, and it is populated with uh, probably five Sparkle queries for this one that fetch relevant content and, and, and some data and pictures and this kind of stuff. So that's one possible usage of uh, this technology in, uh, this technology in, in, in publishing media. Uh, and there are reasons why people prefer RDF, uh, uh, Sparkle and, and, and the related uh, technologies take compared to uh, property graphs and, and cipher. Uh, the major reasons are uh, that for, for scenarios like uh, enterprise data integration, master data management, uh, metadata management, data publishing, uh, RDF does have a number of uh, advantages. The, mo the most obvious one being st standard compliance. Then if you do master data, uh, you want to have a schema language uh, and that's something that you actually don't have if, if you use property graphs uh, because the, 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 the emphasis there was always on analytics on graphs that come and go. So you got a big graph, life eventually, you search some patterns in it and you drop it. But then what if you are you're in the use case of uh, maintaining a big knowledge graph of essentially master data concepts that you care about and then annotating your precious content against this knowledge graph? then uh, being able to, to do proper data governance, to have all sorts of schema uh, validations and, and stuff is really important. Uh, and the, the, the set of standards that, that you have around uh, RDF and Sparkle actually uh, allow you to do so. Uh, then the other advantages come from like, uh, uh, yeah, by design, having globally unique, unique identifiers, having a lot of linked open data. Uh, and actually many of the engines, include, including GraphDB, have uh, uh, optimizations that allow you to very easily make clusters of identifiers which are uh, information about the same entity coming from different sources, which actually makes data linking and data fusion much faster as compared to a situation where you don't have it. And in a way, it's a natural uh, fit for knowledge graphs because most of the knowledge graphs, I believe, are master data, be it global master data the way Google uses it, uh, be it uh, Microsoft Inc. or so something else. <coughs> uh, but these are reference structures, master structures, uh, uh, master data, reference data structures that you want to reuse. At least I believe that's the, the, the prevailing thing. It's not that each graph is uh, a knowledge graph, at least uh, not, uh, not to my interpretation. Uh, and of course there is logical inference. One should be careful using it because it's quite easy to, 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 to get into performance issues and complexity issues. Uh, but again, the, the best practices of using it, uh, people know what, what it takes to scale with their, their benchmarks, which allow you to, 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 to see how this combines with other features and so on and so forth. So one of these benchmarks is linked data benchmarking, councils, semantic publishing benchmark, uh, LDBC is actually an organization, uh, I'm, I'm on the board of LDBC, uh, ourselves OpenLink, U4J, Oracle, IBM, quite a number of the players in this field where we define benchmarks for, uh, well, in three areas for like uh, RDF-based engines, for property graph-based engines, and there, there are some benchmarks for graph analytics uh, for people like IBM who actually don't care so much about what language you're using, it's more like uh, offline analytics to non-transactional. So one of these benchmarks is precisely based on this uh, uh, use case of uh, BBC. So uh, you, have a, you, you have a big knowledge graph, you have a lot of metadata, and then there are two, st two streams of uh, activities. One of them is updates, because if you have a sp sport event running, you have tons of stuff happening <coughs> in parallel. So you have a big number of updates in parallel. And then the other thing is they, they, they call it aggregation queries, which is fetching this data that you gotta publish on the website or somewhere else. So uh, for those, the typical load on, on, on a really big installation is tens of updates per second. And, and for these, you have like uh, hundreds of uh, read queries per second. Uh, and, and, and there are some benchmark results. Just on a single note, you can see that uh, we can, uh, if you have like, I don't know, 10 reading agents and eight agents that do updates or four agents that do updates, you can get to out of a single box, 
with 20 gigs of RAM, you can you can get to like 60 reads and uh, eight or nine uh, updates per second. Uh, we got recently quite a number of questions of, from our clients, how this compares to Neptune. Uh, and we've been talking to the team there and asking, yeah, is there something that we can do better? We try to, to, to do as close comparison as, as possible. We showed them the results, we showed them the setting, asked whether we, we can do something better. The only answer was, well, you should probably get a bigger instance. Okay, I know I can get a bigger instance. Uh, but the baseline is that, yeah, out of the box loading is like five, six times slower. Queries are eight times slower for, for, for Neptune. Uh, so what it takes to get to, to, to this level of performance and back these kind of scenarios for like media or big publishers, uh, really using this <coughs> uh, as a transactional uh, transactional engine to deal with your metadata and, uh, and, and master data. Well, it takes features like, uh, of course, high availability clusters. Uh, integration with uh, full text search is very important. Uh, we integrate with Lucene, uh, Elasticsearch, and so on, and quite a number of other things. So I don't have the time to go deep into all sorts of uh, features that there is complex architecture that allows you to do multi-DC uh, installations with integration with uh, uh, clustered, clustered full text search engines and so on and so forth. Uh, good, I have a few minutes, so uh, I, 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 I'll do the, I'll do the, I'll tell you a bit about why we care about global data and I'll do the demo and I'll stop. So essentially, I believe, we believe that uh, most of the businesses uh, in, in, in a yeah, uh, economy that is getting more and more globalized and interconnected need to deal with global data to, do, to, to, to make the right decisions. So they should combine their own data with global data. Uh, and that's, that's not easy. Uh, it's not easy to match uh, information about one and the same company, your client that appears, comes out of your CRM system, and, and, and a company database that you bought from somewhere else. Uh, identifying entities in text is, yeah, again, another task that, that is not easy to do. So we've been specializing in doing these kind of things in one of the domains with persons, organizations, and locations because you have this in common between many, many business applications. And open data is getting more and more uh, available in this space. Uh, so we believe that in the coming years, uh, yeah, dealing with global, global master data, so taking global company data, locations data, people data, uh, will be a de facto standard and you will not be competitive, your business will not be competitive unless you can integrate this data with your CRM system or whatever and, 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 and take some insights. So uh, the, the, the trickiest part of this is uh, how you do this integration, how you figure out that uh, uh, the Tim Cook that is mentioned uh, in, 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 in this specific document is the CEO of Apple and not the football player. Uh, and this actually requires a lot of the kind of uh, knowledge about uh, entities and concepts that, that people have and machines don't have. Or the kind of awareness of wh what, what Tim Cook is, is and what, what Paul Appleby is and what uh, yeah, Connected Data London is. Uh, so it's a combination of different things, like being able to, uh, know, to know what the differentiating features are, what are the similar concepts, uh, how important is one feature, uh, what are the related features, what are the core current features. The combination of all these things is what people uh, uh, mean when they say, I'm aware of something or I'm cognizant of something. Uh, and it actually takes combining data from different sources to, to get it right, and actually big volumes of data. Uh, and I, I'll finish off with this, uh, I call it awareness game. So I have questions for you. So we'll start off the interactive session, uh, and then we'll see how the machine does it. So let, let's start with the easy ones. Uh, important <laughs> airports uh, near London. Yep. Uh, okay, so uh, 
uh, in this yeah the network is probably a bit slower than it has to be for this purpose so we have uh, sample queries where you can play with uh, uh, quite a number of these things I'll be done in a couple of minutes hopefully uh, if it goes too slow I'll have to drop the demo part uh, okay so we have a sample query that essentially says uh, get the geographic coordinates of an entity in this case one done and then get nearby entities within 50 miles uh, can you guess how many airports are there within 50 miles of London? Eight. How, how much? Eight? Okay, you have 84. You have 84 of them. So figuring out which of these 80 f uh, are the ones that you care about and which are those that you don't care could be could 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 be a problem if you have a knowledge gap that tries to cover it all. So one of the one of the cognitive analytic features is uh, something we call uh, RDF rank. So for each of the airports that we get here, we, we 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 get the rank, and then we actually sort them by rank, and that's the reason why Heathrow, Gatwick, Stansted, City Airport, and Southend get at the top, and that's a generic uh, essentially ranking technique. It's uh, uh, like page rank implemented on RDF graph, and that's part of the engine. So you, you get it, you get it for free. You 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 just uh, you just won't have to say I, I I want it, and and it's being computed, and you can use it in Spark or queries. Uh, you can get uh, like suggestions to see that it's not fake. Yeah, tell me any other city that you wanna check. Any. Paris is an easy one. If I'm not sure how to spell Paris, I can get suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, there you go. Is it right? Yeah. yeah. OK, and then you can do it for all sorts of entity sources. So, um, sorry. you can get uh, the best universities and education institutions. So it's really like not just airports made up for, for the case. Um, would this run in the trace automatically? Would yeah, it? yeah, yeah. It is automatically computed using page rank on the RDF graph. You can tune it. You can, you can say, I want to, to, to ignore these properties and I want to ignore that classes. Uh, but out of the box, it, it goes to everything. Need the data if you don't do the rank in the trace form. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, How is it ranked? I mean, is it location? Is it number of instances? Or it is. It is like Google's page rank. <laughs> so it is how many how many other entities <laughs> refer to this one, and how important are they? Very same like the the web pages. We have a we have a geospatial geospatial uh, indices plugin. <laughs> So you can you can efficiently calculate uh, uh, nearby rectangles, these kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'll do my favorite one, and I'm really done. Uh, so companies similar to Google. So without asking what it means to be similar, businesses that are similar to Google, what would be your first reaction? Your first reaction, Microsoft? Oh, they're many, they're quite a few now. It's like they go, um, they are many search engines. Huh? Amazon. Amazon. Okay, so. Uh, and that's that's based on analytics in, on, on the graph of uh, how many, how I mean, how similar the descriptions of these entities are in the graph. And you automatically get Facebook, Yahoo, Apple, AOL, Microsoft. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, that's an example of like two or three types of analytics, like similarity and importance and few other things, popularity. Okay. Thank you.